and oh, darn it, I recorded to this computer. That's okay. Hello, welcome to the Wednesday workshop. Haley and I had a big powwow yesterday about our go forward plans for July. We haven't announced our workshops there just yet. But we're, we're excited to take things to the next level. We've been running these weekly workshops now for, uh, well, since March or early April, actually. So for a few months, we've gotten lots of great feedback and we want to continue providing as much value as we can and not overwhelming or boring anybody with our you know, recurring thoughts. So we've got some exciting, um, more of like a package offering that will follow a monthly theme beginning in July. And we're really excited about it. So you're, you are all the first to know that July is going to be SEO month. We're gonna talk search optimization like crazy. Getting found, the snake oil that is SEO in a lot of our brains, and it's really not. It is so exciting and fundamentally important to our marketing efforts, but really not that complicated. It's just one of those topics in digital marketing that I find people who are in the know about it love to make it sound a lot harder and more complicated than it is. Um, when, um, when umbrella says my daughter in this moment, when we look at our Google My Business page, for example, just the things we can do with localized search results. For all of us, whether you have a brick and mortar store or you're fully online now, or you're launching incredible new liquor carts like Melissa is for all the parties that are gonna be hiring her like crazy going forward, we have to be found. We can do all the content marketing, all the human storytelling in the world like we're gonna talk about today. And if we're not found in search, it doesn't matter. It's just wasted effort. You're talking to no one. So I just continue to harp about SEO because I know how many of us avoid the topic and we build these beautiful websites, even as agencies and creatives and, you know, website builders, but we don't optimize our sites for search and for Google and for its crawlers to find it. So we're really going to dive into that in July and continue to make sure that everything we teach and talk about is very actionable on your ends and that it's, uh, you know, not textbook bookshelf knowledge, it's really executable immediately, implement, immediately implementable on your ends and you can make big gains really, really quickly. So yeah, SEO, July, what a gross subject, but one that's also gonna be really fun. <laughs> okay, uh, we have been talking a lot about humanizing our content. We've been talking for the last few Wednesday workshops on uh, everything to do with how brands are recovering from COVID, coming back out of it and being real with us, making us like them and trust them, which is a, a hefty feat nowadays, ironically. It shouldn't be that tough. I love, one of my favorite research studies every year is from Edelman. It's a, the world's largest PR agency and they do their trust barometer study every year. And if you look at consumer trust indexes over time and how they have changed, it's remarkable. The things that, of course, if you look even every 20 years, uh, going back to the 50s, to the 80s, to the 2000s, to 2021, and how we feel about the people and the organizations and the entities we used to trust. 1950s, big brands, every kind of spin, just picture Mad Men and any kind of ad airing in your grandmother's living room that you they were prone to buy because it was the first time that the ad age became a thing. And it, consumers are being influenced in ways that they never had before. And, you know, academia, government, religion, media, all things that were trusted, skip forward 70 years. And the only people it feels like we trust or believe in today, scratch the church out of that mix, scratch media outlets, scratch every politician, you know, scratch, uh, you know, academic organizations, because who really knows anymore is what most many people feel and think. So we trust each other, but we can break through that as companies and as brands too, because we can, we are humans. At the end of the day, every single company has humans behind it. I had a conversation with a CBC journalist last week who interviewed me about having a fake assistant throughout my career because I was telling a friend and she told a friend and what do you know, I'm starring in this podcast. And I, you know, we had a laugh about uh, just the way that brands have shifted and changed and become again, more authentic or more solo and then come out of their shells in different ways than they ever have before out of necessity. Consumers are demanding this. We want to know who's behind companies uh, like never before. We want to know who is at the helm and what they believe in. And this isn't new, but it's accelerated and accentuated in COVID. 
we're not just going back to work after a pandemic hit the whole world. We're going back with entirely new ideas around race and equality and history and the companies that we want to engage with. We have entirely new awakenings around environment, around social issues. I loved our Friday coffee last Friday where we all started talking about the about page on a website and what a missed opportunity it is that we're not alongside what our company is about and what we offer, that we're not perhaps care, like carefree describing what we stand for, what organizations and causes our people support to make our employees and our stakeholders feel like they stand for something more than just this brand um, or this widget. So wherever we can, we have to take this to a whole other level. And it takes some creativity. It takes some permission if you're not a solo in your business, but pushing the boundaries to let people know that you are as human as they come. I've given for years examples of this with, you know, for lack of a better example, the oil and gas CEO, the, you know, token, maybe it's a white male executive who has resisted or the entire board of directors who've resisted social media, we don't need it. Well, guess what? You were proven wrong because that's where consumers go to understand and like and support you. Even if you're not selling to them directly, oil and gas pipeline industry, perfect best example of a company or a, sorry, an industry that had the social license to operate unfettered, unbothered and unchecked for decades to the point where we didn't know if they put a new pipeline in the ground. Nobody had a clue in 1992 or 2012 even. And now we're so aware and we're so able to influence their business operations uh, and they better win us over. This is where if they set the stage, we'll engage with them in the right way. If they say nothing, if they hide, if they you know, deflect Jason Kenny this week, you don't come out and be human and apologize soon enough, it's still not good enough. You're an oil executive that's not being real about all the work you're doing on the environment and with good people behind you. Good luck trying to do anything. And most of us don't fall nearly in a polarizing situation such as those. However, we can work wonders for prospects in magnetizing people to us and repeat customers when we just let them in as to who we are and what we're about and why we do what we do. So I've got a couple examples for you today about, um, oh, I guess I should share my screen, sorry. I spent an, an entire half a workshop yesterday with a group from Banff just talking to myself and not realizing they couldn't see my slides. Uh, but so I wanna go through some ideas on authentic storytelling. And I'm also going to make sure that I can see my chat window here because I'd love it for you guys to pipe in with anything that you wanna to add to the conversation. This is nothing but like case study central. We've got so many awesome examples around us of companies that have drank the Kool-Aid of getting really real and, and open during COVID, uh, recognizing that that's what people want if they wanna continue having customers. And then others who are maybe not quite getting it or failing at it. All examples are, are great because we can learn so much from them. Another thing that Haley and I were looking at yesterday in our, I just want to point out as a suggestion, in our uh, content tool called uh, Content Studio, we have a discover tool, which I love. And what it does is it pulls in stories from the internet. <laughs> so it's kind of like a feed burner or Feedly or Pocket. If you have some sort of conglomerator or, or um, uh, story uh, filterer, like it's going to pull things in for you that are related to your industry, your company, your brand that go beyond say a Google search for event planners or event planning industry or dental hygiene. And um, I really suggest like my Feedly subscription is one of my favorite things. And we now pull it into our content marketing because it, it is awesome. Also, you know, content fodder that we can repurpose into our own blog, blog articles, pull stats, just have opinions on things, be part of the story. One of the biggest rules in PR is if you don't know the news, it's really hard to make the news or make news period and be newsworthy. So we've got to stay on top of these things. And when I say case studies, for me, one of my favorite magazines to tune into and the favorite um, place in my Feedly is Ad Age. Because when you see what the big companies are doing and what kind of campaigns are running and how they're scrambling to create something meaningful post COVID or in the era of Black Lives Matter, et cetera, 
you start to see some incredible creativity and it's almost impossible not to get inspired. So I'd really encourage you, even if you're not like considered a marketer, but you're a business owner or in sales or in anything that requires ongoing creativity with your storytelling and your content and your marketing on the, on the whole, don't be afraid to tune into some of those, those articles and magazines because they always um, offer really great case studies. Like we're going to pull a few. So if we were to look at the power of authentic storytelling, hi, Shiva. Good to see you. Oh my gosh, I love your plants. Um, one of the things that we know that can happen when we get really real, and I'm going to breeze through these because I know you guys know what being human and being authentic in your content and in your brand is, but we're going to try and hit home some like actual tactical applications of it. So we can introduce and establish ourselves. A lot of us forget to do that. We're, we're you know, relaunching brands or we're running legacy companies that we just haven't truly properly introduced ourselves as 2021 would demand it. As a new customer, finding you tomorrow on social media would be like, well, I see what you sell, but who the heck are you? Don't forget to go back and give, give us a handshake. Introduce yourself. Do it every six months if you have to. We're seeing this in, my friend Mandy Stobo did a, a really neat video with her art where she was doing, she's a painter and she has a lot of followers, but she has new people that are coming into her fold all the time. And she makes a point of really reintroducing herself every so often on video and just telling us some of the quirkiest, most colorful, fun, behind the scenes personality builders that make you fall in love with her. And that is why people love Mandy's art. I'm telling you, I could sum up this entire session today by saying that it's not that Mandy's art isn't incredible, it really is, but it's who she is, it's her story. Like I'm not an art connoisseur. I like art on my walls or posters or color or whatever, but I am like the worst when it comes to knowing who's who and what's what. But if I know the story behind that artist, and I love it. And she's real and honest about her past traumas and who she is and her kids or whatever she's willing to share, of course. Uh, amen. I can't wait to buy from her. And beyond that, I can't wait to tell my friends about her and advocate for her and refer because she's incredible. You got to get to know this girl, her story. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today where product differentiation is not how we win. It is in human differentiation and storytelling standouts. Because remember, we remember stories, not brands. So we're building our personality and then as a result, magnetizing people to us. It goes without saying that when something resonates with you, yesterday, um, someone said to me, have you watched This Is Us? And I was like, like the TV show? Oh, it was my hairdresser last night. This Is Us. I was like, yeah, I think I watched a couple shows, but it was a bit heavy. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't digging it at the time. I was like, why did you just restart watching it or something? She's like, yeah. And then we both started talking about Mandy Moore. She's, I'm like, that's Mandy Moore show, right? Yeah, I had no idea. Me neither. And then we both went on for about five minutes gushing about Mandy Moore. I thought she was just some cheesy Hallmark girl. Me too, made for TV movies. Or Disney, was it? No, just kind of cheesy. No, in fact, she's gorgeous. I know she's gorgeous. Like it was just so funny to me as I was driving home thinking, I don't know Mandy Moore, but I saw a couple tweets from her that were politically charged. I saw her take a stand on something. I've seen her in this new series just for five minutes, two episodes where she was really real. And it was just more dimensions of this person. I know it's a celebrity, <laughs> uh, but it was hilarious to me that we were both magnetized to her and that she was totally different than we thought because she gave us a little more either in her work or in her real life. Look no further than the celebrities like Jen, Jennifer Garner, who've opened up on IGTV with cooking shows or whatever. Hilarity, humor. It wins people over and I guarantee you it's win, winning those people work. There's a reason celebrities are trying to fire up, you know, weird YouTube shows. Uh, okay, so we can educate and empower. Super important as well. Going back to the basics. If you haven't done that well enough in your brand or if you're evolving or introducing new products and services, of course, you want to educate your customers so that they know who you are and what you do. But beyond that, do not underestimate how cool we feel as consumers when we're in the know. I heard about this incredible uh, cart that goes to parties and serves Prosecco. And it's like this thing that this girl Melissa is doing. And oh my God, it's so awesome. I can barely describe it because I don't really speak her language, but I've got her email in my inbox. I'm going to forward it to you. So now I feel like I've got this thing that I can share. We all love to be the first early adopter or the person who knows something. And that is literally the content pillar of Inspire. 
inspire people to want to take action, make them aspire to be a part of your brand and that they feel like they belong to it. Remember the ABCs of marketing, authenticity, accessibility, authority, and then the belonging piece today is so, so important. I get this brand. I feel like I have a stake in this brand. I will support it forever because they and I have, the sim have similar values and I just really like the people. And then the C of course is content that brings it to life. So people want information. We are constantly searching, digging, Googling, wasting time on social search, Google search, anywhere, YouTube search, trying to get closer to our goals, whether that's to book the right Airbnb or buy a new mechanical pencil. Give us the information, of course, and let us trust you with it. Trust, trust, trust. And that comes from feeling like we know you as a person, you and your people, not because you're placing ads and spinning you know, a story, you're giving us the real version of it. We can grow our traffic and our list and our reach as a result. The rest of these are what happens if we do the first two well. So we're creating original content for our feeds. We have a reason to direct people to our site because it's our content, not some article from Newsweek. And now we've got traffic that sticks around and returns often and gets lost in our content and takes the actions we want them to take. Amazing. So we're driving people to our site, not someone else's, where they're going to convert like crazy, thanks to our beautiful website. We're establishing our expertise. This is the, the authority A word that I love so much because we can all post memes or reposts or beautiful quotes about you know um, inclusion, but we also have to find a way to show that we are an authoritative figure in our field. You can trust me as your realtor because I actually have a lot of time in this industry and I know your neighborhood like crazy and I understand price and blah, blah, blah. Otherwise, you're just someone who has a beautiful Instagram feed with lots of gorgeous homes. But why should I go and choose you? Because again, a lot of people have that first thing. I need to understand that you're the leader in your field for me to really want to bite the bullet. So we build enormous loyalty and affinity when we're doing these things well. And hopefully that takes people beyond loyalty into love because loyalty is more fleeting than it has been in the past. Again, because of the amount of choice consumer ha consumers have and the shop around behavior that we all so easily elicit today. Of course, we can sell in our sleep or at least scale in our sleep if we're not selling on e-commerce or an online platform. But what's happening is that our, our human brand that's out there, that's being shared and that's being so highly resonated with that Mandy Stobel video that I'm sharing because I love her so much, even if I barely know this woman, uh, is now scaling on behalf of Mandy while she's not actually meeting people face to face herself. So what can you do that will help you scale? Build once, sell often. One to many instead of one to one. All of those ideas that happen when we create really authentic content. So we're addressing topics in deeper depth, whether that's you know a series of stories on Instagram. This morning, a girlfriend asked me if I wanted to launch a podcast with her. And I said, I'm a commitment phobe at the moment, but I'll do a mini series with you. I'll do seven episodes that we take your listeners on a journey with because I can't get enough of mini series on CBC Gem podcast right now. And, uh, and it's different. So we can address something in a deeper you know, fashion than a one-off podcast because we have a lot to say. But let's, um, yeah, basically do it in a different kind of format that works. So what can you do that gives depth and breadth and kind of, as they say, don't go wide, go deep where you can to make people really click and share that deep article that has some meat to it, some meaning. It's not just surface level bullshit. My problem with content, Haley and I talk about this often, is like when we're just posting to post. And it's promotional or, oh, maybe it's educational and inspirational and aspirational. Okay. But it's still kind of the same thing. There's literally nothing below the surface. <laughs> but when we have monthly topics that we can anchor in or bigger campaigns or something that we're leading up to, because it's an eight week launch countdown that our users don't really know yet or our followers, but we've got something in mind with some brilliant stuff that's going to keep them coming back for more. Well, now there's depth and breadth to our content. Otherwise, it's just noise on the internet sometimes. So finally, we can get really creative if we choose to get, you know, that 
the human aspect, if we draw it out of ourselves, maybe you're not able to find that in video or it's not your medium or podcast or whatever, choose some long form blog posts, or maybe you're awesome or your team is with quips on Twitter, like Wendy's who we're going to look at in a minute. It doesn't matter what it is. There's so many mediums for you to choose from today, but don't choose the one that makes you clam up or that makes you feel like it's just not quite your bag. You don't have to be everywhere. You don't have to be a video star or an Instagram star or a TikTok star. You can dive deep into really rich blog content that you make sure gets seen because you're sharing and proliferating it as you should. But either way, the creativity behind your topics, subject matter and platforms is like endless if you let it flow. So we're supporting our social media content goals we're getting ourselves to our bigger, broader marketing goals, but we're doing it just by starting with this whole human side more than ever. Second part of what I want to talk about today is just basically the purpose behind it. So we're thinking about, you know, the truths that we are, we're, we're seeing and that some of the evolutions and changes that have happened in marketing and in consumer behavior over the last year or two in particular. And this line, of course, is not new, but I really want us to think about what it means to each of us. Like who for me is a really human brand? I've used the example a few times for you all of AMA. When I went to finally get an AMA membership last year after letting it lapse for several years and before I was on some family plan that my mom was still paying for. And I was like, oh my God, I got to grow up and get a, get a you know, roadside assistance here for me and my trailer. So what, it was just this very pleasant experience. And I would love for you to think about a pleasant experience that blew you away, probably just because they didn't overcharge you. And there was a human on the other end and, you know, it was seamless and easy. Like there, as much as I always say, expectations are so high for users and followers and fans today with the kind of content and the load speed of your website, et cetera. Our expectations are also pretty low when it comes to someone just being human. So start there. That's like the lowest hanging fruit in the marketing world right now is that an actual person will speak to you on the phone and that they're going to be kind and get you there. And I see this all the time. Someone will write us at social school and they're like guarded or they're mad that they can't log in. And the moment we choose that absolutely everybody gets back in I will find a way to get you something if it wasn't your past course or we'll work through it with you, their shoulders drop. But we generally, I find, myself included, go into conversations thinking that we're going to lose. So, you know, is this an opportunity for you to create delight? And that, that can be that sticky thing we always talk about. What are your sticky bits? Your customer service, your return policy, your friendly telephone operators, um, like we saw with goodlawyer.ca a few weeks ago in Friday Coffee, the onboarding specialists that are literally sitting there waiting to book a free appointment with you to tell you what you need for legal advice, because I have no idea. I'm a, not a lawyer. So how human can you be? And what is that for you? What is the, an example perhaps, or what do your people value? And what is maybe missing in your industry as a whole? that if nothing else is the biggest, you know, entry point opportunity for you to fill. There's so many of these in so many industries and in this rush, rush, rush to automate things, have more chat bots, get people along the line faster, they fall off because of simple frustrations that there's no human side to this. So who are we speaking to? What do we need to convey to them? And then how do we bring that to life? really keeping in mind, of course, the whole time, what do they need? What is their goal? So we stop making it about ourselves. I say this all the time. It's about them and the problem you're solving for them. When I land on your website, it better not be about your earnings report, your, you know, how great your staff is, like they give where they live. Thanks, tell us, but you're still charging me $180 a month for my cell phone. So now I'm pissed off because maybe you should give to your customers and actually make my phone work before you brag to me about how your staff and your company got 79 days off each last year and they gave $40 million to the community. I just feel a disconnect because you won't answer your phone. Things like that, just a little bit of a loaded conversation. So what is it that you are solving the moment I land on your website? Because I don't care where you went to school or how many awards you won. I wanna know why you're gonna take my pain point away. 
even if it's just about, you know, booking travel or buying that t-shirt. So then the second piece, just show up consistently, honestly, and authentically at every stage of the buyer journey. We have an entire 360 series lab called Customer Journey. And it is about all of those entry points and the funnels and the journeys that we all experience along the way. Whether you take two steps to get to checkout as a consumer or 20 steps in four months of following a, a certain company or four years of being nurtured along in their emails till you buy. It doesn't matter. As the company, it's our job to make sure that we show up and we keep them engaged and um, fulfilled along the way. I'm gonna talk about that in a second as we talk about something I love to call the subscription business that we all have. So another example, Wild Prairie Soap, you've heard me talk about this company uh, out of Edmonton, a, a gal named Tanya, who I adore. She came down and did our social retreat a few years ago or a couple years ago. And uh, in the pre um, kind of work that we did to determine how she was standing in her customer's eyes and in the, in the greater international kind of audience that she was trying to fill, we asked a, a physical customer um, you know, how did you hear about Wild Prairie and why are you buying the $23 soap and not the $1 bar of Dove from Walmart? And this gal's, I'll never forget this line. I've actually never seen their ads. Yes, I like the product, but I, what I love are the hands that made it. So thinking about the hands that made it. Um, Melissa brought us a great example in last Friday coffee about a wedding vendor who was just nasty and awful and not getting back to her and, and higher and mightier and just lost her interest versus a supplier that she's using in her new company that was just kind and fun and got her and made her feel appreciated as a customer right from the get-go. And again, it's not that difficult. So the hands that made it example is not because they've met Tanya or they know Tanya, the owner, but they know her story. They, Tanya has been human enough and present enough showing up where she can online, not everywhere and not all the time, like some YouTube star, just honestly and authentically where she can. And that got seen and shared and people are immediately magnetized to what she stands for, not necessarily the ingredients in her soap. That helps the quality, the locally made, sure, but there's a lot of those, but it was the story in the hands. Um, so be the, the solution your people are seeking. And then number two, as I often say, do it in a clear, concise and compelling way that gives them reason to click, make it easy on us, which is a whole other subject matter. Okay, finally, you guys, I just wanna wrap up by talking about, you know, how real is this brand? How honest do I feel like they are? How much can I trust them? And the changing, yes, customer journey, but also customer ex expectations, particularly in 2020 and 2021, we have been changed as a humanity. Our, I, my own language has changed. Um, I'll share something with you that's super inappropriate because I'm gonna try and be vulnerable here for a minute. My phone, for whatever reason, used to correct the word new to Jew with a capital J every freaking time I write new. And I just stopped correcting it. So between my husband and I, everything is now this like, you know, Jew chicken sandwich that I tried today or this like, it's, and now I realize how just inappropriate, right? Like things that even as, see, I'm embarrassed saying that. My, my son is so into World War II and Holocaust stuff right now too. So it's even more topical, I could cry about it. But anyway, it's an example of how our language and how our understandings and how our ignorance has come through in so many ways. And I'm not afraid to say that because, you know, the residential school stuff this week, the amount my kids are learning. My daughter said, oh, there's a something the other day and it was a raven and she used uh, the Blackfoot word for it. And she's a six-year-old Caucasian girl, you know? And I was like, why is my generation so ignorant? We saw it again in London, Ontario this week. So like, we can't underestimate. I'm gonna be the scapegoat here and just say that I've been totally remiss or fallen short on so many of these things about, you know, our collective human condition and how that relates to my customers and who I wanna be as a brand. And some brands won't give a shit and they won't change and they won't even recognize. Like the campfire conversation I had two weeks ago where the fellow said across the fire, yeah, it's not easy to be a white male right now. And I just about lost it. So there will be ignorance everywhere. 
And as long as we know who we are as a company and we decide who we want to serve, and I'm not saying this to be, you know, the fluffiest, most altruistic brand in the world, but expectations and dialogue is changing. I read the most incredible article today on Medium and I had to forward it to my girlfriend and it was called, um, we're all paying for someone else's four hour work week, not ours. And the whole gist of it was that, you know, the four hour work week and the digital life and the entrepreneurial nomad is like awesome in theory, but that there's people paying the price for that for you. And, you know, it was really calling out Tim Ferriss's, his bro fans who are, I'm totally generalizing, but so too was this article. And it was really interesting because it talked about the entire ecosystem that props up the multi-million dollar four hour week work weeker with, you know, all the services. It's just like we saw in COVID frontline workers that go well beyond medical care. So how are you reaching or understanding and I guess just addressing that? And I, I say this because it's um, something that I think a lot of us have been afraid to bring up in our organizations and that the definition of human brands has been really surface level for a while. And I don't know that we're gonna get to something meaningful unless we're willing to at least scratch the surface of it a little bit in the dialogues with our own companies. So I would encourage you to find a couple ways to do that even if it is as simple as like we talked about at the outset, and I'm really talking at you today, I apologize. Um, but just finding a way to convey the things you stand for and the causes you support. Not because it's mandatory, there is some expectation. If you're a big enough brand, there's a definite expectation, but you know, silence can also say a lot too. So there's so many opportunities to do really, really well while doing good. And I think a lot of us are kind of missing some of those as we just continue status quo, or we think we're being really human because we're sharing our favorite soup recipe. So what, who we are and what we sell is everyone's business, whether we like it or not, you can take that as deep or surface level as you want to. But if you set the stage, they will engage. And again, you know, I love researching those ad age magazines or marketing mag to find stories of companies that have taken real risks here that haven't turned out to be risks at all. They were exactly what people were waiting for in terms of like showing up and just going, oh my God, finally, here's a brand I can stand behind because they truly understand and don't support child labor or whatever, right? In their apparel business. So this is what I love. Sorry, let me just go back to that. Um, Today's transformative marketers know where to go and how to show up. That's what we should do as marketers. And we should understand that now by listening to our customers and seeing where their attention is. But today's winning brands deliver an orchestra of experiences by starting with the listening and then really kind of laying out this path for their customers to tread that feels really good along the way. So if we think about ourselves as this subscription business, basically what we're saying is that along the way, we have experience makers and experience breakers. And these can be physical, like literally just tactical things in your booking process, or they can be deeper. When someone discovers that you actually have a weird stance on the environment, or you're afraid to speak up in your industry about X, Y, Z real issue or whatever, it could be you know, emotional or physical or something more surface level. But the orchestra of experiences uh, looks kind of like this. Let's take Wendy's for example. So just because I love Wendy's Twitter feed and they, I love how they roast McDonald's and they're constantly winning awards or being called out as like, you know, the quippiest, um, sassiest brand on, on Twitter and they can get away with it because they're a fast food joint appealing to, you know, mostly 20 somethings. Uh, if I go into their store, and their, their restaurant and it's dirty and the staff are rude and they forget the patty in my bun. It's not that like, I'm gonna be like, well, I still love them and this burger because that Twitter feed. No, it's an experience break along the way. And those are just like two stages, but there can be many, many stages. Take WestJet, for example. You know, we're familiar with their Christmas giving campaigns. And as marketers, we look towards those and we love those. But as just general public, we think, oh, that's a really, you know, big hearted brand. Uh, their booking process, dead easy. 
I love their credit card because I earn points for my travels and it's just, you know, got lots of other perks. I check my bag for free. Uh, the check-in process with the app, dead easy. It's just like everything is seamless. I go and now I have a physical touch point at check-in with a very nice human who actually matches the whole brand. It's consistent here. I'm seeing a pattern. And then um, likewise, you know, right into sitting on the plane. But then I order my Wi-Fi and I pay my $13 and it doesn't work. And I'm like, again, I'm ticked. Like how dare this plane not have Wi-Fi working? And it just goes to show. And those things are of course, you know, inevitable. There's breaks often along the way. How we deal with those breaks is really important and how we um, see them in advance and have the foresight to change or adjust along the way. So, so important. And my point here, is that more of those breaks are coming in our messaging and in our failure to show up as people. It's not about your app not working. It's more about the fact that your storytelling is really vanilla and you're not standing out at all as a result. Easier said than done for some brands. I totally get it. But baby steps towards, you know, just addressing and, and showing up and, and being modern brands like we've never had to before. If we were having this conversation in late 2019, I'd be like, come on, let us in, show us behind the scenes more often, show us your people, make more candid videos. Tell me about that, you know, that favorite album you've ever had as this, the executive or the sales team or whatever. And now it's a little deeper than that. So don't be afraid. I encourage you to be the bravest marketer you possibly can. And while you're at it, thinking about that kind of seamless, unforgettable journey along the way. The one that even if it's two steps long and it's just literally, they saw you on Instagram, they went to your website and they ordered that cool water koozie or water bottle. Um, and it, it arrived on time and it was an easy checkout process, great. If it's much deeper than that for you and there's physical and digital touch points all the way along the way and then repeat and you know follow up, et cetera, uh, how can you make those as delightful or simply pleasant or easy as possible what do your people need how can you uh how can you be that human that that gets it for them so the result is the sort of yeah delight leaving them continuously interested in our brand and wanting to share it wanting to advocate for it wanting to create reviews that you don't even have to ask for um and then of course you know they're moving towards their goals and they're moving you towards yours because that of course leads to sales in the modern day world we live in. It is not about ads necessarily. I mean, they help, but not about spin or shoving a message down your throat or ignoring the true conversations going on right now. That was a bit of a rant. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to kind of go that deep, but it happened. I've read a lot of emotional stuff this week, I think between, um, yeah, well, so have you. Does anyone have any thoughts? Anyone want to add anything? please. You guys are quiet. I read um, another kind of issue of the week. Uh, I'm spending too much time not focused on my work. But anyway, distractions. There was a, a really incredible story on CBC yesterday about a female carpenter in Ontario and um, she was being sued for $15.5 million by these two fellows that host a podcast called The Construction Life. And on their podcast, they had a guest and the three men were making a ton of jokes about whistling on work sites and how it's the norm and how it's totally accepted and acceptable. And then the one said, even if it's not accepted anymore and the cops are gonna be on me because it's not like it used to be, I'd still reach out and grab them. He just made horrible comments. And this woman then like reposted their comments with a lot of screen grabs or text interlay overlay about um, unreported sexual assault in Canada, um, just general stats that were really harrowing. And uh, anyway, the comments. So she, last I checked, she went from 4,000 to 6,000 followers yesterday. I was so compelled by it. I chimed in a couple times and she um, was just like, yeah, she was taking one for the team and standing up only to get sued by these assholes, which I think backfired. 
but I saw last I checked yesterday, there was 800 comments and they were all just like overwhelmingly, unbelievably supportive along the lines of like, why is this still okay? How has this taken so long? They were suing her for emotional damages to their podcast because she posted their comments. Like it was just unbelievable. And it wasn't a me too thing. And it wasn't like cancel culture. It was just like enough, you know, but anyway. It was neat to also see the, the people weren't shying away from supporting her, put it that way, like endless comments saying, how can we start a GoFundMe for you? And thank you for, you know, bringing this to light. This, this has to change immediately. And, and in some cases, you know, I feel like we're not going backwards as much as there's been maybe lack of progress on some things. Like when we look at, are we really that further, much further ahead than last year after George Floyd and everything else? But then I think on some ways, no, it's totally changing. Amazing. Oh, thanks, Ro. Rainbow washing. Yes. I read a little bit about that week this week too. Um, showing up, but in a surface level way. Very important piece of the Potter. Thank you, Steph Potter. Sorry, I called you Ro. Um, so I believe rainbow washing is where brands are really getting in on Pride Week in the ways that they probably mean to do it in a, you know, well-meaning fashion, but it, it's also a revenue opportunity for companies. And I think you could see it sort of both ways. And I love that you brought that up. Thank you. If anyone knows anything else about rainbow washing or has any thoughts on it, by all means, love to hear them. It's a tough one. We often talk about how do brands step into Pride Week, Women's Day, you know, whatever it is, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. How do you do things in a meaningful way that doesn't feel like a trite you know, avatar change or profile kind of reskin just to be part of the conversation, but, or just to feel like you did. And I think that what we talked about on Friday, I, I loved the more we discussed it was that if you work back and work a few of those really passionate causes or dates or milestones and months into your calendar for the year, your monthly sales and marketing layout, that you can really get behind them in a great way and you can incorporate them as like profiles like here's five women we want to profile in the month of march or here's what we're doing for pride week or why we love it or ways we've engaged with it like it doesn't all have to be here's what we're doing here's who we're donating to um but just again bring out the creativity make it meaningful and uh and don't do it last minute knee jerk. Cause then I do feel like it, it is like what I would consider rainbow washing would be that surface level stuff. You don't have to be trying to sell to LGBTQ community, but just, you know, turning your profile into an avatar and saying you're an ally. I don't know if it's enough or if it makes sense to do. Anyone have any thoughts on that? Anyone doing anything for pride month? feeling like they should man I'm really on a red hello hi how are you doing good how are you I'm good <laughs> uh sorry my name's Kina and and I did have a question uh not necessarily about pride month but um I am working as a social media marketer for a few different companies and we want to get more into creating an authentic voice in social media for these companies uh and i was wondering what are your thoughts on if you're just kind of starting out in that realm uh do you jump right into social issues or or build up more of that uh like the background of the people of the company or their story yeah i think you probably want to lay the foundation first you know if you were to picture a brand at a so-called cocktail party and a new company coming in to introduce themselves to their audience or to their friends or the community you wouldn't just start off with very blunt, deep conversations about what you stand for, right? You'd want to say hello and let people know who you are and why you're doing what you're doing. And even those introductions alone can be much more colorful than they used to be, right? It's not just about like, yeah, when the company was founded and what your office hours are. It's like, here's who we are. 
I thought that again, that good lawyer co um, company that we were introduced to uh, was doing that Rachel kind of showed up and walked us through. She's the new marketing manager there. And it was fun to look at their website and their social feeds, just to see these smiling members, staff members, founders, uh, investors, just p stakeholders that were, um, yeah, they had a story. They had a lot of personality. They had a lot of different kind of colorful aspects to them. And that alone started to exude their values and their purpose. It just happened organically. So I would say if you can find a way to introduce yourselves with some backstory on each person, that's not just their LinkedIn credentials that uh, you could really win some hearts and minds quickly. Do you wanna share with us what the company is, Kina? Uh, it's a few different, I'm actually working with Liz that is also on the call here. Amazing. So yeah. <laughs> She, she's my higher up. So she also, she manages me. So we're working for the same company at Evolve. Uh, but we're working with a, a few different companies in Calgary and one in Toronto. Uh, Von Viva and Sleep Boutique, which they sell like custom modular mattresses. Oh. Uh, we're also working for a place called Financial Concierge, uh, which helps seniors with their finances. And a few other places, there's an industrial uh, bag company. So they create uh, bagging solutions for agriculture and other industrial areas. So it's, it's a few different places and all in very, very different industries. Amazing. Uh, Melissa or Shiva or Haley, does anyone wanna weigh in on that? Anyone have any thoughts? That's so cool, Kina, thanks for sharing. We'll always talk. I'm always chatty. <laughs> I'm not today. Um, I think we, we touched on this a bit last week too, but um, I struggle with what to, you know, make, make my point about and what not to. Um, generally in my own personal kind of work, um, I just do a lot more with the community, like community events and fundraising for, you know, families, just even in Mackenzie town, we did in, in, uh, over the holidays. So I tend to kind of say something when I feel really passionate about it, but then I stay quiet when I'm, when I'm just, you know, because I don't want to be um, inauthentic, but I think sometimes, like you've mentioned, it's made me think the last couple of weeks, like, is saying nothing looking bad, but I don't want to say something just for saying something. So it is a teeter-totter. Um, and then there's always a day, there's always a, you know, a month, um, you know, something to talk about. You could do that literally every day. There's like cookie day and Caesar day. I'd like, right. those. yeah, <laughs> but I tend to st pull back unless it's something I'm really in. Um, but you've got me thinking about like saying nothing. Cause I've never perceived it as kind of me being ignorant, but I think it just depends, right. It depends on your business. Would you say Kelly or. Yeah. Well, and I think too, when we're thinking about what um uh, without being too surface level shallow hollow you know and just kind of showing up ignorantly or even just again just kind of really surface level with a new brand like that's that's what you should do that's the baseline but how can we maybe differentiate ourselves a little bit and to what degree and that's a personal decision for each brand so if I was marketing for a company as a, an agency or I was in, in the department, I would probably position a few options. Here's a few ways we can push the envelope, you guys. And you know, asking for some of that kind of almost crowd support or, or engagement, weighing it out, asking for permission to A-B test a few things. What if we did an article on this? Or what if we try to post on that? Or again, we're gonna look to what people are doing online companies in our industry and out of it to see what we love. We're all users, we're all scrollers and consumers and we know what turns us off and what turns us on. And very quickly, it's I find it quite remarkable how you can come to consensus in, if you can get together with your team and your client to decide who you wanna be. And once those conversations are allowed to be had, so it's not just about what product are we promoting this month, I don't know, some of that really kind of uh, groundbreaking or, or boundary pushing stuff just naturally comes out. But I would also say that just choose joy, like pick the happy stuff too. That's what people want more than anything right now. We know that coming out of COVID, we want reprieve. 
We want, we're all exhausted, ironically, even though we're heading back to work. And uh, we want to find joyful stories and feel human moments that are really honest and true. And I think that's also because we feel like we've been snowed by some of the people we did trust, or we're so tired of hearing from the, you know, the people on the other side, or that just, there's been a lot of negativity weaved in the last year, or a lot of tragedies. So if you can find, if you're, if you're unsure of how to enter a conversation and be real, I would say choose something goofy, fun, human, entertaining. It's the stuff we resonate with. And actually, I just want to read a couple things. I was going through some notes on my phone on the weekend as I was cleaning it up. And this is from November 2nd, 2019. I was reading some Seth Godin stuff and I, was, uh, I had to write it down. So he often talks about what the change you seek to make. And so this is from Marketing for Good. It was a, uh, just an e-newsletter he wrote. Your promise is directly connected to the change you seek to make and the people you seek to serve. You have no chance of changing everyone. So you need to change someone. And then he often talks about the you know, 1,000 true fans. Choose 1,000 true fans based on what they dream of, believe in, and want. Psychographics, not demographics. The stories they tell themselves. George Laycock calls them worldviews. Organize your project, market, and life around the minimum viable market. Find a position on the map where you are alone. You and you alone are the perfect answer. Overwhelm your market with change. So profound that people can't help but talk about it. Um, and then I just love, focus on the customers, the only focus for a new project. Your work is not for everyone. It's for those who signed up for the journey. Shun the non-believers, or at least don't worry about them. Good feeling emotions, attract people to you and magnetic messaging always wins. So asking, how can I serve? Shifting from a get mentality to a give, from what you can get to what, yeah, asking, uh, making it about service, not your ego or bottom line targets, ROI needs. Sharing, growing, expanding, living your purpose and shifting your energy is the fastest way to get out of a state of lack. Um, and when you shift into the abundance mentality, it's what attracts more of what you want into your life and your business as many of us know. So. Anyway, maybe just a good reminder for us all that good feeling emotions attract people to us. It's okay to also take a stand on things that aren't so shiny and rosy, but um, yeah, they're going to hear you when you have something to say that's not so shiny and rosy when you are constantly sowing good emotions and, you know, good in the community, I suppose. Okay, I've preached enough. Any other final just a good reminder though, Kelly, too, because you know, we've been talking about kind of these, um, you know, things we should be having a voice on, but I know even like personally, like we watch this as us and we watch a million little things and we, you know, they really wove into those stories, black lives matter movement and COVID. And it just, we, this is our like one hour without kids and work for the day. And we, we love the shows, but we just, we were like, oh, I just don't want to relive this. Like we shut it off and we went to the crown. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think we're all exhausted from all of the negativity and living in this pandemic that, yeah. um, and I, I just, I, I feel like the things that are more joyous and we're giving so much energy to the negative things. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's such a great reminder that people are like craving these positive things, like, and yeah. like a joke about national cookie day, but like, yeah, let's talk about cookies. <laughs> and I think I would say after like looking back on what I have or haven't done a year after George Floyd, and I I have some regret, uh, or not regret, but I'm like, I could have done more and what have I done? But then I think talk about National Cookie Day, but don't not talk about the other stuff too, right? I think that's kind of where brands have landed and it's neat because we can be both. And I feel like we've come out the other side of it where we don't have to be quite so afraid to say the wrong thing as opposed to just like saying something and, and yeah, saying more, right. Just show up. And talk about what, you know, like when you were, you were very, um, you, you were the, the head of all the taxes that went up in, in Inglewood there, right? Like it was just Kelly duty everywhere, <laughs> but it, but you had passion and you had a stake in it. Whereas me to say something about it had nothing. And then there was recently this um, Calgary education curriculum emails and Facebook posts swirling around, um, you know, so the moms were sharing that and they had something to say. So yeah, again, thank you for this week and last week because it's really 
it's giving clarity to where to go, right? And do both, but pick, pick, pick your lane. So thanks. Yeah, I love that. Well, thanks for saying that. And actually you just kind of planted something too, Melissa, maybe we can all take away is the idea that like a lot of people have a lot to say. I sometimes get embarrassed because I'm like, oh my God, I can talk for hours about taxes and I dove deep into property taxes on behalf of small businesses, but I can't speak up about Black Lives Matter. So, but I think, and that's, that's okay. I've work to do. However, um, there is, but there are people in my organization that have a lot to say about their passions. And, and if you're a solo, what about your suppliers, your customers, your staff? Like we always talk about show the end result, show your customers at the end of tax return season, how you help them because you sure as heck can't make content about like spreadsheets and tax tools. So show the people that you've transformed and supported and, and their journey of transformation. But also what do they believe in? What do they love? Like, wouldn't that be kind of a neat way to show customer testimonials and profiles? Let's go deep on the people in our fold and get to know them. Because again, we love stories. Tell me more than just the, show me your tomato supplier from your restaurant, sure, and the farm. But as my editor, you say, what else? Show me more. So now we can go a little deeper. Like, what are you passionate about? How do we better understand each other? You know, my hairdresser last night, who's an anti-vaxxer, I was like, Tell me why. Let's understand each other, you know? And I don't think we do that enough. So anyways, thank you all so much for the conversation. <laughs> and really, really appreciate you all being here and lots of opportunities for us. It doesn't have to feel like, oh my God, I'll, the only thing we can say right now after COVID is like, we're better together. No, no, no. We can say so many cool things in, you know, through the summer and then going into yeah, fall when everything maybe returns to normal in a whole new way. It's just like, yeah, things, things are different. Thanks so much, everyone. Hopefully see you again next week. And uh, yeah, see you online too. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>